everyone. Welcome to another episode of the Oriri podcast, the podcast that tells African stories. I'm Halima. And I'm Ceci. And today we are here with a very special guest, Abigail Isse. Did I pronounce that right? Is it Isse? Isse? Yes. Isse. Isse. Yeah. Yes, Isse. <laughs> to talk about her travels around Africa and the diaspora. So this should be a really, really interesting episode. Why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself, Abigail? Yes, so you already know my name is Abigail. Um, I'm Nigerian, but I'm from Benin City, Edo State. But I left Nigeria some time back. But you know, when you hang out with Nigerians, your parents are Nigerian, you just never stop being Nigerian. So right now I'm studying accounting but I'm still into um, traveling, talking about culture, history. So whenever I travel, I'm not the regular vacation girl that will go to the beach or to the ocean. You will most likely find me like around the cultural areas, museum, and just hanging out uh, with locals. So, yeah. Very cool. So I'm sure you're going to have a lot of country-specific information for our guests who are very eager to listen. Um, I always want to talk to people who travel like through Africa and who don't just do the typical tourist things because mm-hmm. I really want to know. Personally, I would love to, like it's my dream to just travel, you know, around Africa. One of the things I even wanted to ask you about is like passport struggles, passport issues, visa issues, unless you don't have those because you know, mm. like they say it is, it is easier for like, Africans especially Nigerians to travel like to another continent than it is to travel within Africa would you agree with that yes I definitely agree with that so right now I have a Nigerian passport but at the same time I have a permanent resident card from Canada so there are places that the card can take me to that my passport cannot take me to which makes it easier for me but it doesn't make it hard per se because let's say for example recently when I went to Cuba, I went with a friend that had a Canadian passport. Because of your Nigerian passport, they will actually single you out. While it will take a Canadian passport holder or a U.S. passport holder five minutes to go through the border, it will probably take you like 20 minutes because they will ask you questions like, what do you do? Where are you working? Can I see your return flight? They're just this weird vibe around Nigerian passport. So the struggle for sure is there. But it gets easier and you just get used to it. And you can always apply to visa for visas and stuff. But I'm not sure how it will work for Nigerians that are in Nigeria because they tend to give visas to people that are in Canada or have that Canadian permanent residency. So it's definitely a struggle because it's embarrassing when everyone just leaves and you're the only one there. So for sure, it is a struggle. But if your passion is traveling, like you will not care as long as you enter the country, like you enter, be you know enter. <laughs> so that's it. Yeah. Um, I'm just curious, Abigail, how many countries have you been to? Like not just African countries, but in total. So in total, yesterday I was trying to count and mm-hmm. because I just started this last year, I've been to like 10 so far. And in Africa, mostly just the West African countries, because I wanted to start with something that I'm more familiar with in Africa, like you know, West African countries, we kind of have like similar cultures, similar food, similar accents, and stuff. So, I've mostly been to the West African countries, but apart from that, I've been to Caribbean countries like Jamaica, Dominican Republic, and I recently just got back from Cuba. But I have more travels this year, so you may want to watch my space. That's really cool. And, like, how many days do you spend in these countries? So it really depends, but most of the time I spend a week because I'm doing these travels like maybe in the first week of school. So I'm missing some classes or I'm doing it like during my vacation time. So it's either like anywhere from seven days to 10 days. Oh, that's really cool. And can you tell us like what inspired your like this interest in traveling? What inspired it? Okay. So there's something that I've been reading about that is called a travel book bug so apparently once the travel bug bites you like there's no turning back you just keep traveling and traveling and traveling so right from when i was younger um in fact my dad till today still calls me holiday maker like i i always itch to do something like that time we used to stay in worry i would be disturbing my dad to take us to port and then when we get to port 
I would be disturbing everybody in the house. Let's go to the beach. Let's do this. Let's do that. And then when I moved to Canada, I had this one trip to Mexico. Like it was really spontaneous. I just like asked my sister, do you want to go to Mexico? And then I just booked the flight over to her. So when I came back, I was like, I like this. Like I want to travel more. I want to see more places. But I, at that moment, I didn't have the funds that I have now or the time that I have now, even if I still don't have enough time. But yeah, then I took another trip to Dominican Republic and I was like, okay, this is nice. I want to do more of this. So as funds started opening up, I started traveling more. But another thing I realized about my travel is, as I said, I'm not a beach person. I like going to history places, cultural places. What I noticed was, Whenever the the cultural tour, the historical tour is not um, African or Black, like it doesn't really interest me because I feel like the other cultures and history, people already know about it. Like it's what they are teaching us even in Africa. In fact, they even teach us other people's history more than our history. So I was like, okay, like I'm more interested in African history. I'm more interested in African culture. And then I noticed that a lot of things that I know, some people don't know it. And whenever I talk about it, they're like, oh, wow. And then it just inspired me to start like educating people and also inspiring people to visit Africa and other countries that they will not visit on a normal day. So, yeah. I very much agree. Uh, thank you so much. Your Your statement about other peoples or other cultures already being very known and very popular as opposed to African culture is very, very true. And this is one of the reasons why we started the Riri as well, because African culture just does not have the platform that, you know, let's call it British culture or or um, Nordic culture, ECC has. Um, so yeah, I think that's very interesting. And I, I like how you said you wanted to go, to start with places that are familiar to you. I think is very interesting as well. Let's talk a little bit about that. So as you traveled um, across West African countries, can you mention some West African countries you have traveled to and then discuss things that you found similar amongst them? I did Togo and Benin Republic when I was a bit younger. So I don't know if I entirely experienced it the way I was supposed to experience it because, you know, the more you travel, the more you get to know yourself, the more you're more open to trying things like taking risks. But my most recent is Nigeria and Ghana. Nigeria, because it's my home. But whenever I go to Nigeria, I'm more like a tourist because I don't really have anybody there. Yeah. So your question was, are they similar, right? Yeah. What are the similarities you've seen amongst West African countries? Okay. Yeah. Okay. So the similarities I've seen between the countries that I've been to is, number one, the accent is the same. If you're Nigerian and you have been to, like, other countries, let's say you travel to Canada, the first question they will ask you is, do you speak French? So the reason they're asking you whether you speak French, like when I go to Canada immigration border, the minute I ask them like, sorry or pardon, they're like, oh, they just switch to French because they automatically assume that I can speak French because of my accent. But that's because most West African countries, they speak French and we all have like similar accents, like Ghanaian accent, a little bit of differences, but someone that doesn't know would think that we are speaking the same way and then another thing is the food like the food is very very similar in ghana you can find a goosey soup okra soup amala a redu jollof rice even the still war about jollof rice the same thing in togo benin republic and i was researching senegal recently and it's also similar as well and then the religion there's christianity and muslim religions like in maybe almost all the West African countries. So like, you know, some things that you're not supposed to do, maybe dress a little bit modestly, don't act a certain way and all those other things. And then what else? And then I think normally like West African countries are very hospitable. They are happy to receive foreigners. In fact, it used to annoy me a lot when I was younger that West Africans or Nigerians, when they hear somebody with like a foreign accent, they'll be happy. Like they'll say, ah, Oibo, welcome and stuff like that. And then apart from that, okay, this one is a bit off topic, but like West African men, then I don't know, my experience with them, Sha, is that they have been nice. Like whenever 
I need help or anything. Like West African men are always open to help. They always appreciate their women from my own experience. So I wow, Halima, 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 Abigail, I, like I was <laughs> really going. I was. I'm coming for you, Abigail. What? So, what? Like, whatever nice. I travel, whenever I travel, I always feel good because, like you know, <clears throat> they're always like, "How can I help you? Let me try. Let me do this." So, like. It's not like I'm flirting with them or anything. It's just there's a part of me that feels comfortable because they are there to, you know, help me and guide me in my trip. <laughs> Did you, you have a bad experience? It's a trap, with, Abigail. Um, it's it's a trap. Like, it's I was actually going trap. to say the same. I was going to say it's well, actually you know, a trap. I can see both sides. Like, yes, they are. Yes. It's true. It's true. <laughs> Honestly, when you go, man, they're actually hospitable. They're hey, really hospitable. Hey, they're oh, Charlie, Charlie. Yeah, it's true. <laughs> Honestly, and when just, you travel, they appreciate your beauty. Yeah, yeah they, they they that's their the hobby to appreciate your beauty. That is their hobby. What? <laughs> <laughs> Mm. I very much agree with you both in that absolutely West African men they are yeah, so helpful the they are so though. nice <laughs> no, uh, nah, they are so nice they are, when you first meet them you know they are hospitable they say oh, my sister in my country oh let me you? help you yes, let you. me help you and yeah. like, even the women too mm. the women too like they always like have you eaten do you know yes, where to eat yes. and everything like you can actually trust them yes, like but... there was this one time where like I got my period like in the middle of everything and then I just knew that I could just reach out to any woman and they'll be of help they'll give me sanitary pads and tampons like I feel I felt comfortable I'd not feel I don't know there's just this nice feeling of absolutely being West African, African women I can vouch for them they will always come yes wherever you are mm-hmm. and for the men I can vouch that they are very helpful initially you just wait like three six months first <laughs> Then <laughs> that is when you will see the other side. I okay, that's why I'm not there for three months. Uh, let me just do my one week and two weeks and enjoy the niceness and go. That is the best strategy. <laughs> that is the best strategy. <laughs> okay, can you tell us about an interesting African history you've learned about in a non African country that you've been to? Like something yeah. in the diaspora, like in yeah. The Hundred percent. So I just got back from Cuba, like I said, and I'm obsessed with Cuba. Like I was like, if I have time in June, I'll probably take a weekend trip there just to the talks and stuff. So the thing I learned in Cuba was this: you know how in Nigeria we demonize African religions. Like if you see all this, we call it sacrifice. Unquote. Like when you see all these things. Let me say Babalao thing in front of a Nigerian person in house. You'll be scared, you'll be afraid and stuff because of how we have been taught about those things. This one is a bit sensitive because I don't want to offend anybody, but I'll just you say, based on my experience in Cuba and based on my experience in Nigeria. So like, I mean, it, it's okay that we are afraid of it. I don't even know if it's okay that we are afraid of it because of our experiences, with maybe personal experiences or the way they have been portrayed in movies and on TV or in the cinema where the person that practices an African religion is always the person that means bad for a family or for a person. But when I went to Cuba, African religions, they were not allowed before in the past, like in Cuba, because, you know, it was like a slave trade area, they brought Africans like Nigerians, mostly West Africans are the people in Cuba, because you can see from the facial structure that this person is West African. So like the religions are just practiced differently there. They are not using it for bad stuff. It's just how they express themselves. Like for example, you know how in Nigeria we practice Sele and other things. In Cuba, they practice something that's similar to Sele, but it's called Santeria. I just actually did a video on that on my Instagram. So like in that religion, it's like a mix between Catholicism and Yoruba religion. They have gods like Shango, Elegua, Oshun, like all the gods that we have in Nigeria, they have them. And then they also have things that are similar to Igbe festival. I don't know if you're familiar with this one, but they usually practice it in worry. And I'm just like, okay, this is, nice to know and at the same time it's also surprising because they they practice those things more openly in cuba 
than we do in Nigeria. So it was very interesting to learn that. And it was just nice to see how African religion over there is definitely not demonized, but it is demonized in Africa or in a place like Nigeria. So, Thank you so much. I actually feel like every single episode I talk about this in some capacity, I always mention, like, why is it? that we cannot talk about our own heritage and we cannot platform it and we cannot celebrate this. But meanwhile, we are watching Thor. Oh, mm-hmm. Meanwhile, we're watching oh, Thor. God. And we're watching Zeus and Poseidon. But no, Shango. Oh, God. Yeah. Anyway, it's all the same, really. And there's no reason why ours cannot be as platformed as as other religions, as other... Right. Like, they don't follow it anymore in Greece, but it doesn't mean that they mm-hmm. pretend it, it didn't happen. They still have exactly. museums, they still talk about it, they still write about it, etc. Exactly. So, exactly. yes. Thank you very much. So, do you want to talk about any particular memorable experience you've had while traveling? Because you've been to, you know, quite a few places. Is there one that, or is there a memory that has really stuck with you? My dear, I've been thinking about this thing since since I got the request from you guys. But like, there's no memory I have that is like particularly memorable because the entire trip is just a high. Like, the entire trip is so exciting that everything, that's why whenever I come back from my trips, I'm usually very sad. Like, I don't do anything. I don't work out. I don't engage in something that really needs brain power. Because I'm replaying everything, I'm relieving the memories, and I'm getting sad because, like, the entire trip is a memory. Like, whenever you go somewhere, or whenever I go somewhere, like, anywhere, and I hang out with Africans, learn about them, like, be in touch with them, their families, it's always so memorable. So, like, I'll just say the entire trips I've been to, all of them, they are all memorable. So I don't have any particular experience that I would say, oh, this one was very memorable because I'll feel like I'll be cheating on the other experiences and it's not fair. <laughs> yeah. So in that same light, I'm guessing you can't pick a favorite country. <laughs> favorite I can. Country. I mean, like, what I say is every time I come back from a country, that's my new favorite one because, like, it's my most recent. I recently enjoyed it. It's still in front of my head. So, like, I'm just, I'm a bit biased towards Jamaica though, because the vibe there was different. But now that I'm back from Cuba, I'm now biased towards Cuba. So, <laughs> Oh, that's really cool. Um, And then has like your travels changed any perspective you had about like Africans and the African continent? I would not say it has changed any perspective. It's more like it has confirmed the perspective that I had. Because, like, the things that I thought about Africa before, and then I'm not sure if I really know how to answer this question. Because if I did not grow up in Africa, then I'll say, okay, I had some perceptions about Africa that are not true. But I did grow up in Africa. I'm African. My parents are African. I have African friends. So I don't really have any perception about Africa. I just know things about Africa, right? And then, okay, the only thing I'll say has changed is, you know how maybe you have not been to Nigeria or somewhere in Africa or one of these countries in a while, and then you start hearing things on the news, like, oh, the place is not safe, be careful, they steal from you. It has never happened to me. Like, maybe you'll be scared at first. You want to take a bit of precautions and stuff, but it has never happened to me before. So my perspective in the sense that some of these countries are not safe is definitely cancelled. And I keep, anytime people ask me, I always tell them, I don't know what they're talking about because I cannot relate. And also another thing in that sense is that I'm I'm not sure if I'm also supposed to be giving my perspective on that topic because whenever I go to these countries, I just kind of blend in because I'm already Black, I'm already African. Like, I blend in with people. You may not even know I'm a tourist, except I'm wearing like a flashy cloth or I'm just doing something that tourists would do. But you will not know that I'm a tourist because I blend into the countries that I visit. So, yeah. So perspective in terms of safety changed for sure. But ever that thing has been confirmed and it hasn't changed. 
Mm, okay, that's really, really cool though. Yeah. Yeah. And then um Ceci, do you have any question or should I go ahead and ask the last one, which is that um, um I do have I do have two quick oh, ones. Okay. So first of all, speaking of blending in, um you know, some countries, the language is different, right? There may be some cultural barriers. How did you navigate those? Like, is it that you found a local and then you became friends with them or? Mm. or... <laughs> it is hard. Like, hey, one went to Cuba. Like, if it's French, like, I feel like I have intermediate understanding of French. Like, I can, I can hold a conversation in French because it's something that we learned in school. Like, in my school in Nigeria, they used to, I learned French too whenever. And then I came to Canada and I also continued learning French. So I can hold a conversation. But you see that Cuba, Spanish. And you know how in some French countries you would meet a handful of people that can speak English. But anytime you talk to these people, they're like, no, no English, no English. And then they were just like, no, they cannot help you because of that. So how I overcame that one was Google Translate. So I downloaded the entire Spanish thing on my phone. And whenever I have a question, I'll just type it in English and show them. And then another thing that helps is Duolingo. So Duolingo just helps you to learn the basics. Maybe you want to order food, you want to say hello, you want to ask them how much, like the basic things in Spanish. So I was able to overcome it through that. And then I met this one local that had like a very good like English background. And then we became friends. And then I could like message him if he had if we had questions and stuff. So that's how we're able to navigate it. But the first two days was very confusing. Very confusing. It was wild. <clears throat> okay. Um, I think my last uh, question for you, I just want to do a quick fire round. I'm asking three questions. So I'm going to say like a characteristic and then you have to say which country you think wins this, like which country you think has this the most. Okay. So first is most hospitable. Jamaica. <laughs> Okay, second is best food. Nigeria, hands down. <laughs> Third is most fun. I'm so sorry, but still Jamaica. <laughs> uh, I think you do have a favorite, even if you won't admit yes, it. Yes, I do. Yourself. I do. Um, Abigail, if you could like answer this question from like picking an African country, which is the most hospitable and which is the most fun? African country, ah, mm -hmm. Nigeria now. <laughs> oh, okay, so Nigeria is mo was like in your opinion, yes. Nigeria is the most in hospitable and the most fun. And the most fun, yeah. I feel like wait, the deck wait, is wait, too wait, stacked wait, on wait, this. Wait, 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 wait. Okay, I think most hospitable would be hospitable in the sense of like nice people, right? Like nice people, nice everything. I think hospitable would be Nigeria, and then I just give the fun to Ghana because. In Ghana, it's easier to have fun. When I was in Nigeria, the traffic to get to wherever you're going, before you get there, you're already tired. Like, I was so upset with Nigeria. I didn't do what I wanted to do because I was just, like, tired. But Ghana, it was easy. We're, we're actually club hopping, going from one club to the other, like, visiting, like, multiple clubs in the same night. So, yeah, it was easier to have fun there and just, like, chill and relax. Nigeria is definitely not a place to relax, but Nigeria is hospitable for sure. Oh, that's really, really cool. And um, for someone that's just starting out, which country on the African continent would you advise them to visit first? So it depends on the kind of person that they have. That they have. I mean, it really depends. If you think you are ready to actually dive into culture, culture, and just like leave your Western expectations beha behind, right? You can try a place like Ghana because Ghana, their tourism is really good. Like they make their place very accessible for tourists. And then you could also try somewhere like Rwanda because I had Rwanda and Tanzania. They're good for cultural stuff. But if you are not willing to leave your Western expectations behind, like you just want to do something that you're already familiar with, then you can try South Africa because they are very good in terms of that i've not been there but from the videos i've seen they have modern stuff everything works nice or better than maybe some other parts of africa so it depends 
Nice, nice. Thank you so much, Abigail. Any last questions from you, Ceci? Um, no, I think that's it. But this has been a very, very fun talk. Thank you so much for coming. Thank you for agreeing to speak with us. We've had a great time. No and I've actually learned a lot and enjoyed the conversation. So um, you guys who are listening, if you want to follow Abigail through her travels and learn more about the country she's been to, you can find her on Instagram where she is Abigail Ise, that is A-B-I-G-A-I-L underscore I-S-E. Um, yes, so go ahead and follow her on Instagram. And um, yeah, I think that's it. Thanks for listening. Bye, Bye. everyone. Thanks, Abigail. Bye. Thanks for listening, guys. Make sure to like, subscribe, follow, and tell your friends. To stay updated, you can also follow us on social media. On Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter, we are Orire underscore Africa. On TikTok, we are Orire Africa. And on YouTube, we are Orire. Orire is spelled O-R-I-I-R-E. You can also find us on our website, which is orire.com, where we have articles about African mythology, history, and food. Contact us via our website or social media if you'd like to come on the podcast. We'd definitely love to have you. If you want to support us, you can do so by subscribing to our Patreon, which is patreon.com slash Africa. And um, all of this will be listed in our description box below. Thank you. Thank you.